So if you're joining us on Facebook Live, welcome. I'm having a conversation with Mark and Nancy celebrating Martin Luther King Day. Happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Good morning to everyone. It is my pleasure to be here. In fact, it's my delight. And I pray God that we have something to say that somebody who can hear wants to hear and it will make some changes. Amen. Here we all are. Nancy, I before you joined us, I was just listening to you two playing a song that they wrote in 1985, which is called Pride in the Name of Love. Are you struggling to hear me, Nancy? No, I'm, I was thinking okay. about and the song. song is about the song was about Martin, Lu Martin Luther King. And I remember it because I was a 20 year old standing at the back of the King's Hall in Belfast listening to you two sing that song all those years ago. Um, and, you know, I didn't know much about Martin Luther King. Um, but you, as you approach your 90th birthday, have lived through a lot and seen a lot. Tell us uh, what you think about on this Martin Luther King Day uh, as relates to him. And we're going to then, I hope, go ahead, get on to talk about uh, a message that he also spoke about, which is the leadership lessons in life from Jesus. Well, when I think of Martin Luther King, first of all, I think of a, of peer. a peer. He was a he was a peer. I was one of his peers. He was in his thirties. I was in my thirties. Um, he was just a tad older, I think. But he had learned so much so early. And frankly, that's because he knew God. And he walked in what he knew. That's what struck me so. Many of us know many things, but do we walk in it? Wow. He learned early how to act toward his fellow men. And he believed it. You know, God said, if you believe me, you'll obey. And sometimes I wonder, do we believe? Martin Luther King had made a decision. Remember the last where he said, I've been to the mountaintop? Everybody remembers that speech. Because he gave it just before he was killed. And I would say, I would gather that even if he knew it, because some, he, I believe he knew that he was nearing that place. And I think he would have done exactly what he did. And it seems so right for him to die while going to defend garbage men, the poor. It just seems so right. It fits with the rest of his life. He learned, he said he really learned it from Mahatma Gandhi, if you recall. Now I'm just recalling this because it was part of my daily life. I haven't just really decided to study Martin Luther King. But he was an unusual character with character. <laughs> right. He was unusual character with character. His children later exhibited that thing that they had learned from their father. They still do. Martin Luther King was very young when you stopped stop and think about when he started this. So young and so sold out. So fixed. He 
he wouldn't right. change his belief because somebody up there in, in some high seat didn't agree. He kept what he believed in. He kept it front and center because it came out of the word. He believed that what he said was a part of following the pattern that had been laid down by God and had he had preached and he saw in his own heart, Jesus walk out that pattern. So that's what he was working to follow. And when I think of Martin Luther King and this day, this is many years later and I, as I think about the readiness to leave, to take off, that if I perish, I perish, kind of Esther talk. Martin Luther King reached that age from what he said in his 20s. Mm. Now, I tell you, I certainly didn't. Um, I've been saved a long time, but the, the, the philosophy, the absolute knowing, the Job kind of faith, right. I didn't have yet. And Martin Luther King seemed to have stepped out at a point where he went to college that's where he was. That's what he knew. He got the picture. Right. Um, if you take care of real religion, as the book of James said, is taking care of widows and orphans. He got that thing. That's why he could put together the poor people's march. I think many of us and I, I begin with myself. We are still very selfish at 26. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some, uh, some of us later 26. in life. <laughs> well, I, I know that I've just started to contemplate in a way that's real. I've, I've, you've contemplated it before. Your own demise, your own death. It's hard to view the world when you're young without you in it. Because <laughs> you think you're the, the greatest, the this, the that. In fact, it's a mark of youth that you're going to live forever. That's why these people run around here without a mask on their face. I don't need that. I'm here forever. And you said, don't you see the people dying in the hospital? Yes, but that's not me. It's hard to see the end of yourself in your youth, when you're strong and you're viral and you, you know, got all this real life going. You feel the life kicking in you, it's so strong. So it's hard to see that ceasing for any reason. Mm. But somehow Martin Luther King had gotten a hold of that. Even with children in the house, because you said, well, if he if he had not had children, we could say, oh, well, you know, he didn't have children. He, he wanted, to, we want to live for our children. No, he had children. And I tell you, he had a magnificent family because his wife also not only uh, allowed that, but she participated with him in it and the children are doing that even now so it's special it takes a special kind of god had put special characteristics in her him like he did job it was though i perish yet will i serve him so it wasn't about martin luther king it well, was about god yes sir well, Nancy, I'm just I'm I'm just interrupting you for a second because there are lots of great friends who have been popping through on Instagram Live and probably don't realize we're also on Facebook Live. 
and an Instagram live, I'm hoping because they're not seeing your picture that they are hearing the richness of your message. Uh, Nancy Harden for the friends who've just joined, who is uh, just this uh, later this week is going to turn 90 years of age and was a, a peer and a contemporary. Yeah, next week, Sunday, right? Saturday. Saturday. Okay. So uh, Nancy's going to be 90 and she's seen a lot and she's heard a lot in the Oakland area of California. Were you always in the, in the California, Oakland area, Nancy, in your journey? Uh, since, since I was 18 years old. 18 years old. Wow. Right. You were a teacher, right? Yes, sir. How many years did you teach and what age group were you teaching? I taught is of 20 years that's not I didn't teach that long I was in churches doing more than I was just as much as at school okay. but I taught I taught teenagers I taught uh, seniors and I taught juniors the last three years I taught middle school I wanted to see because I had a reading uh, credential as well so I wanted to teach reading to boys. So I worked with the uh, with uh, boys in school, but I, after school, I worked with the, what they call PAL, the Police Athletic League. And they were teaching after school children to read. And I said, I wanted to teach boys uh, because they had di more difficulty learning to read. Well, I want Ted to chip in in a second, but I do have a question about that age group. And, you know, as the lyric from U2 song talks about a shot ringing out in the Memphis sky, from that moment when the, all of the, the energy and the, the life was taken from Martin Luther King, um, you know, what do you see has happened? Uh, fast forward to today, and what are your prayers today for all of that generation that you are, um, that you educated and that you continue to walk with in so many different ways? Well, sometimes my heart bleeds because I don't think people truly listen to teenagers. It just happens to be my favorite group now. Uh, I'm sure God did that because most people like little children <laughs> um, and babies, particularly women. They like little babies. I like teenagers. I love teenagers. Let's put it right straight. I love the fact that they say what they mean and they are clear, even if you don't want to hear it. And um they're my special group, and I love the fact that if you respect them, if you show them that you respect them, they'll in turn respect you. Right. I love the fact that they don't pull back with if you if you do something you or say something, they feel that you shouldn't have said, they will go high to try to top it. And um what I really like is taking them out to have them to meet outside the classroom so that I have time to talk to them. And if I taught you, I would also visit your home, even when you tried to get me not to do that. Uh, yeah, I would say as a school kid uh, back in my teenage days, I would not have been too keen on the idea of my teacher they, visiting my home. <laughs> That would, that would That's not have right. <laughs> they did not want it. They would tell me flat out, don't come. My mom won't like it. And I said, That's all right. I'm coming. And I would not let them know when. Now, some of them, they were fine. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of some of the guys like Felix Mitchell in Oakland, who was the head drug guy lived in the project, I went to his house and he was there to meet me, to introduce me to his mother. And uh, I liked him and he knew it. Um, I, I wanted them to know that I liked them. 
And when they got into anything wrong, I said, I'm coming to your house tonight. I want you to be there to meet me, to introduce me to your mom. And uh, they did. They did. Love, loving your neighbors in a very material way. I, I really, uh, I love that. Funny, uh, I got up early this morning and uh, the Lord had me in the 28th Psalm. And I don't know uh, if you probably know it all off by heart. No. It taught me, it said the third verse, and it said, um, Do not drag me away with the wicked, with the evildoers who speak in friendly ways with their neighbors, whilst malice is on their hearts. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, rich similar verses, but I tell now, you, you know, loving loving our neighbors is is one of the hardest things to do. And uh, Jesus, of course, took it even further, and that he said that we had to um, to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. He was always raising the bar, wasn't he? Yes. As a matter of fact, this is what I say about. Jesus in uh, uh, Matthew 5 when he's doing his first teaching um, Jesus took that whole Ten Commandment which is you know thou shalt not and shalt not because it was law Jesus raised every one of those things but he based it on love Yes, Every right. one of those, he, when he said, thou shalt not kill, he said, you should not hate your neighbor. You, you, don't, you don't do tit for tat. He said, love those uh, who um, mistreat you. Can you imagine that? You don't get back, you don't pay tit for tat. Uh, there are a number of things in the law that's if, if you did something wrong, you took a man's cow, you were allowed to, to do something to that man, but not in the Sermon on the Mount, which is, you know, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. One sermon, he made sure that we understood everything was supposed to be dealt with with love. Wow. I, funny, uh, you know our friend, General Julie Bentz, who... Uh, gave the prayer at the National Prayer Breakfast 2016. And when she was on active duty, she used to, she used to lead a Bible study around a group of generals at the Pentagon and, else, and elsewhere, a great uh, sister. And Julie does a Bible study on, on Saturday mornings, which is now, of course, on Zoom. And I was there on Saturday. And what were we doing? We were doing Matthew 5 and starting into 5, 6, and 7. And I was reminding them that this whole passage 2300 odd words so those of us who write speeches for leaders from time to time know that that's a 20 minute speech uh, i'm guessing in fact uh for somebody uh with a a, a different style of delivery president obama was one was one like this he would have taken 30 minutes <laughs> I'm guessing Jesus took even longer because I'm hoping I'm, and I'm, as I see it in my mind's eye, I'm seeing all of the pauses and the silence as those gently admonishing yet encouraging words to everybody, everybody, you know, hit home with those who were sitting with him on the hillside. Yes. I was thinking about, yes, uh, Obama would have taken um, longer because after every word he would be saying, yes, you can. But <laughs> <laughs> what I was thinking also that Jesus's thought would be, because I love you, because yeah. I love you after each thing. So particularly when he got to the this is the one I, I uh, had problems with. Forgiveness. Yeah. Jesus said in that sermon, uh, Matthew 6, 
14. If you don't forgive others their trespasses, God will not forgive you your trespasses. That's it. There's no, there's no wiggle room there. That's it. The finger is here. It's not out there. Right. You forgive or you will not be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Do not add but. Now, this may not sound good to some people. I always say, move your butt out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> move your butt out of the way. I love it. Because you have to, this is direct. This is internal. You, you don't look out there. This is it's inside. If you don't forgive, your father will not forgive you. Well, now we know we know there's no third thing. There's no uh, you either going to heaven or you're going to hell. There's no intermediate thing for you to go and prepare and get ready, pray your way into someplace else. So you're going to have to do it God's way. This is not a request. This is a command. So I must forgive you. Because if I don't, I walk around here miserable. Because a young man said, I love young people. This young man said at my church years ago, God won't let you down, but God won't let you back. Wow. And I, at that time, didn't know how I had forgotten purposefully intentionally that there was something that I had held and it was against and you only held hold things against folks you, you love or was close to you it, it was about my husband <laughs> of course that was the closest one to me and I said when I finally admitted that what God said was true guilty Lord guilty that's what we should do. Hands up. You're guilty. And if you remember or think you've done something, you need to talk to God about it. So I said, if you let me out of this place, I'm going in the church early in the morning and I won't come out till I know I'm forgiven. And you know, yeah. God is faithful. God yeah. said, if you speak me, with all your heart, you will find me. So I'm telling you, I never want to be in that situation again. So that's what I think about that. <laughs> Ted. Yeah, I know this is, this is really rich. I'm really loving it. Um, so many questions are coming to mind. I was going to ask you to tell us more about when you learned how to forgive. <laughs> Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> I think you touched on it, yep. but, uh, so uh, 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 if you have another story about when you learned how to forgive, because like first, when you mentioned that MLK, Martin Luther King Jr. was your contemporary, that really hit me. Uh, because, you know, I mean, you, we have such a vibrant relationship, like, you know, uh, I, I, you don't feel 90 to me. I mean, I feel 90, you feel 50, you know, I mean, I feel like we're the same age. <laughs> trying to keep up with your energy and i think wow that's sad martin luther king would be 90 martin luther king jr would be 92 this year probably 91 yeah, right this moment yeah, Man, we were yeah there's a whole lot of people we who were are even 90. born in the same month there is a lot of people who are 91 that are making a huge contribution that are going strong boy what it just hit me how much we lost you know <sighs> wow um, um, yeah, praise God. Uh, the other question, well, well, here, let's leave that. Tell us more about when you learned how to forgive. I want to hear more. You told us one story. Tell us another story. You weren't always holy. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, I had to ask God to forgive me because he, I spent my, I told you, Ted, when I was young, I was angry with God. 
and uh, I lived in Texas and uh, we had an outhouse. Young people, tell the young people what an outhouse is. And um, I would go, my baby sister would always want to go with me because there were 15 kids in my house. There was no place to pray, to talk to God or anything. And I had been angry with God for oh so long because I would always ask him, why did you kill my mother and father? And uh, I didn't say, why did you let them die? You know, nice. I said, why did you kill them? Um, and I would go in the restroom in, in, the, in the outhouse to talk to them you know, about that. And I, I felt like he needed to say something to me because the aunt who was raising me, I said, well, you just could have killed her. <laughs> That's how kids think. And uh, left my mother or my father. They both died the same year and I was two years old. My baby sister was five months old. And my, it was my baby sister that always tried to go to the uh, outhouse with me because she was always trailing right there with me. And, and as I said, it was a two-holer so she could sit and I could sit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would talk out loud to God. And I did it for years. And so one of the first things that I had to do is to ask God to forgive me. So um, for thinking of him in that way, because now I knew that was a God. My aunt talked to God all the time, out loud. And uh, I, I knew God was up there but I also thought his address was a, uh, my address because my aunt acted as though he lived in the house. She told him everything around all day. My aunt was one of those people that pray without ceasing. And, and we really didn't care for her prayers. But I had to learn to forgive her and God. So God just... You know, it's, it's fine with God. Because here's what the Lord said to me, and you find that in Proverbs, that I had a wounded spirit. Said your, your spirit is the thing that helps your body to heal. But who can heal the spirit? Well, the only answer to that is God. And I had a wounded spirit and I had carried that wounded spirit, I guess from the time I was very little. And um, he healed it, he healed it. So that was it, that was it. I'm still working on, on you, Ted. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Is there another question? You know Somebody something? wanted to know about woundedness. Okay. Yeah, I'm just saying. I just I'm just typing that word in. You know, I mean, it's amazing. Um, I think about one of my favorite um, stories. One of my favorite accounts, historical accounts from scripture, uh, is the story about Nehemiah, who was uh, who was tasked by the Lord with rebuilding the city. And I remember back many years ago in Northern Ireland, uh, challenging some community leaders, encouraging them to hold people back who were uh, bent on civil disorder. They felt they were being provoked. And um, we encouraged them. A lot of folks prayed that it wouldn't happen and we held them back from re-engaging uh, in practically hand-to-hand -hand combat, but you know there were petrol bombs already assembled, that type of situation. 
And uh, I remember um, telling them that, you know, this story in Nehemiah, he knew he would have to withstand untold provocation. And he would have to, uh, Jesus said it later, turn the other cheek in essence and not listen to the untruths being told. But truth be told, we are wounded and hurt when people say things about us or yes, we are. it, you know, words hurt. Yes. And it's our response to the hurt, isn't it? You're just describing it so beautifully, the response to the hurt, the unilateral response with the power of the Holy Spirit response to turn the other cheek and to have a different um what actions you take what do you what are your thoughts about that i was thinking about it while you were talking of course words hurt words build or tear down god made heaven and earth with words he said light be he divided the waters from the waters with words. And in Hosea 14, 2, he, we no longer have to bring calves and bulls and goats as a sacrifice. He said, bring words. That's the importance of words. In fact, in John 1, 1, Jesus said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. And the word became flesh. Words are so important. Word, I call words cups. They're like jars. They hold things. They hold attitudes. They hold the way we treat others, the way we think about others. It's so important what we do with our words because they can rip people to shreds. I've seen little children stand up with their parents uh, saying something or with somebody else berating them and tears just start to roll. They never say a word. But while being dealt with with words and I've heard my own family members said I'd rather have been beaten then they have to hear those words. So I never put down words. Words are what God used I to create us. He used words. We see it in Genesis, the spread. We look at, at Jeremiah, I'm trying to stop now. I think about how Jeremiah wept how he begged and he said, oh, Israel, turn, turn to God. Turn away from what you are, turn to God. And he did it with words. They didn't want to believe that, but those words came to pass. The truth of those words were important and they had to live it. Sure was. That's why this morning at my prayer, I was gonna say, when God speaks, it's not a request. Um, a request means you can do it or not do it. That's why God speaks in commands. There are consequences when you don't follow. That's right. Hey, Ted, you got some thoughts? No, oh, man, I, I got so many thoughts running through me. This is just really rich. Um, you mentioned something, um, and I, I, so I want you to educate me a little bit more. I know you're a history major. You mentioned how impressed you were and inspired, you know, being a contemporary of Martin Luther King. And you said you saw him as your peer. He wasn't someone older than you. Um, and you were, um, but, and you said how he, how he laid hold of a faith and a vision in his 20s that most people don't get until if they ever get till later if in they life. they ever get, right. 
And so I began to think, well, why was that? What do you think? And I've also heard incredibly inspiring stories about his parents, but I don't know that much. So I was going to ask you, tell us about his parents. I really don't know that uh, his mother at all, but his father, he would remark about his father. He got, I don't think things just start with your father. I think it rolls all the way back. His father, his grandfather, and on. A foundation was laid in Martin Luther King, starting with his parents, yes. But he was also a reader. And I, as I said, if you want to talk about a parent, Mahatma Gandhi was a parent to him. He took that philosophy. He believed you don't, you turn your cheek, you don't fight back. Well, that came from Jesus. You know, Mahatma Gandhi was not a Christian that it, I ever heard of, but I tell you, any time you can pull any philosophy out of here that works, truth comes from God. Truth, Jesus is truth. So anybody picking up any little portion of that, they are running with that. So feeding the poor, taking care of the orphans, helping the widows, all of these things. When a country does that, this country used to do that. When a country does that, um, that country is blessed. That country is blessed of God. See, God honors his word. You said, but those people aren't Christian. But that's God's word. God honors what he says. If someone is doing that, they are going to be blessed. In the same way he said, he would bless those who bless Israel. Yeah. So when I get on, I make sure I bless Israel. Because God said so. Hmm. God said so. Hmm. 